Beautiful day in the neighborhood. Reaction Beanie Yo 425. Day in that neighborhood. My brothers and sisters. It is that time once again, my friends, to go back to a man where every time that I watch a video from him, he educate me in some type of way, man. Like I learn something new that's very, very interesting. And that man that I'm talking about is AJ from the Y Files. The Y Files Saturdays, y'all. And the title of the video is Knights Templar Forbidden History and Their Secret Quest for Atlantis. Now, y'all know I just keep it real over here, man. Y'all know I keep it honest with y'all. I don't know what the hell a Knights Templar is, man. Like, is that like a group of knights and they was named the Templars? Like a knights gang that was named the Templars? Or I don't know, man. And then it say forbidden history. So it sounds like these knights got some stuff going on that's secret. They knew a way to get to Atlantis. But the, the, the outside world didn't know. I don't freaking know, y'all. This one's going to be good, man. And it's also 55 minutes and 22 seconds long. So we in for a long one, my brothers and sisters. So y'all know what y'all got to do, too. Get whatever you may need. Get what you need, please. Another The Wi-Fi Saturday. Y'all got what y'all need, y'all ready to go. Then let's fucking go. This episode of The Wi-Fi Files is brought to you by PDS Debt. The accepted narrative describes the Knights Templar as humble warrior monks protecting Christians on the road to Jerusalem. The Knights were later betrayed and ultimately destroyed. Damn. But there is another story within that story. It's a legend filled with murder, mystery, and buried treasure. And it involves a secret powerful enough to rewrite history and change the world. Yes, the Templars were in Jerusalem protecting Christians, but that was their cover story. The real reason they were there was they were looking for something, ancient technology. So as soon as the Knights Templar arrived in the Holy Land, they started digging. And then... Get whatever you may need. Yeah. AJ will hit commercials, but I'm already thinking hard, y'all, because um, it's the Knights Templars in the Bible. Like some of y'all be like, like, be like, what? You never heard of them from the Bible? No, because I really don't know the Bible that well to keep it 100 with y'all. Like, I don't know all that stuff in the Bible, man. But it sounded like because they were sent to go protect Christians. Like, is this a story somewhere in the Bible about that? That's just my first thought. And I had to think real hard. Like, damn, have I actually heard of them or not before? But I haven't, man. And what AJ talking about as far as why they was really there? Hmm. This is gonna be crazy, y'all. It's a long ass commercial from all uh, AJ too. But um, PDS. Let me take it back. PDS dealt dot com slash files. If you know you want to get that discount. But let's go back right here and let's go for real. The Knights Templar were formed in 1118. At least that's when they were officially formed. The real story began many years earlier in Constantinople, now Istanbul. Istanbul was Constantinople, now it's Istanbul, that Constantinople been a long time gone. Constantinople, what a Constantinople get the works? That's nobody's business but the Turks. What? 
Tell me that song didn't pop into your head the second you said it. No, it did, but do you mind do if do I... Do Istanbul! The Brothers of the East was a secret order formed in Greece that eventually set up their headquarters in Istanbul. They practiced alchemy, they studied sacred geometry, they performed rites and rituals incorporating astrology, astronomy, music, and mathematics. So when Hugh de Paines, a French nobleman, met the Brothers of the East, he was excited. De Paines was technically Catholic, as most of Europe was, but he had family members who were of the Sufi Islamic faith, which is the more mystical side of Islam. De Paines had been told of this secret group that possessed and was protecting ancient knowledge. He wanted to meet this group and see for himself. At this time in history, Europe was in chaos. Various kingdoms were rising and falling and warring with each other. In the East, Muslims and Christians were clashing. The world was tearing itself apart, yet the brothers of the East possessed a peaceful wisdom. They weren't concerned with modern politics. The brothers had a purpose that was much more important. Once mutual trust was established, the brothers of the East told the European visitors their story. Well, not their story, the story. Mm. Here we go. It was the story of an ancient civilization that thrived thousands of years ago. The people were highly spiritual and highly advanced. It was a civilization that was free of poverty. Wealth was meaningless. They devised methods of growing crops so that every citizen was fed. They could control the weather. Droughts and famine were impossible. To Hugh de Paines, this civilization had abilities that sounded like miracles or like sorcery. They could communicate over long distances instantly somehow. They had a way of levitating objects no matter how large or how heavy. They had medicine that could cure any illness, allowing people to live very long lives. War didn't exist. There was such an abundance of resources that anyone can have whatever they wanted. And what these people wanted most was to pursue their own spirituality. What were these people is? This civilization sound like they freaking aliens, man. Like, this some alien shit. Do you mean to tell me thousands of years ago this was happening on Earth? Am I getting this shit wrong right now, y'all? Am I not understanding this correctly? Because this sound like all that right there, what the Wi Files AJ just said? Man, how that it? I don't know, man. I don't know. That sound like some alien shit. Like, for real, for real. Like, or, um,. Thor, for my Marvel fans out there. Wolf Thor from Asgard? That sound like Asgardians. And then they were gone. How, DePaines asked, could a civilization this powerful, who seemed to be able to control nature itself, be suddenly wiped out? Yeah. The Brothers of the East said in a single day the ground shook and volcanoes emerged and erupted. Then a giant flood swept over the earth and destroyed everything. Ah, I know where this is going. It was then that Hugh de Paines and his eight knights learned of Atlantis. Yahtzee! And that's another thing with a lot of these stories from back then, man. No matter the religion, the culture, whatever, a flood always freaking happens. It's always a flood. Noah's Ark and whatever the other names for all the other... Uh, nationalities and religions and cultures out there that they want to call it but y'all know what i'm saying with noah's art and that that, that that story is not just in the bible now it's a lot different in a lot of i'm not gonna even talk about it that much long story short story long go check out one of my older reactions or go check out from the white files about the noah's ark and all that or go check out his video either way it goes long story short short story long again <laughs> It's a lot of different stories about floods destroying the earth and then the earth come back. Let's go. Hugh de Paines and his fellow knights were riveted by the story. De Paines was a nobleman, a count in fact. He was the Count of Champagne. Le Mouet Champagne. Oh, pardon my French. De Paines was an educated man. He knew about Plato and his stories of the island of Atlantis. He thought they were just stories. 
The brothers said Plato was mostly correct, but Atlantis wasn't just a city or even just an island. It was a civilization that spanned the globe. And each city was connected using transportation technology that again sounded like magic. The story became almost overwhelming. Almost. The brothers said that ancient relics of Atlantis still exist, and they still possess their power. The power to travel great distances, the power of communication, the power to heal, perhaps even the secret to immortality. If ever discovered, these artifacts would be the most powerful and dangerous devices on Earth. Depain said that any kingdom, any country, any religion would kill to have access to this power. The Brothers of the East agreed. The technology of Atlantis could not fall into the wrong hands, so Hugh de Paynes was offered an assignment. Find the ancient artifacts and bring them back to Europe for safekeeping. Hugh and the other eight men immediately agreed and formed a secret fellowship. But where do they start looking? The brothers said they'll find artifacts under the location of what used to be King Solomon's temple, the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. The knights would have to act quickly. The Holy Land was a dangerous place. Jerusalem was taken by Christian crusaders in 1099, but who knows how long they can hold it. And there was another problem. It wasn't just the knights that knew about the artifacts. Groups of Christians, Jews, Muslims, they were searching too. So when the knights arrived in the Holy Land in 1120, they set up their headquarters where Solomon's temple once stood. They officially became known as Poor Fellow Soldiers of Christ and the Temple of Solomon, the Knights Templar. Mm. And the Knights played the role of courageous warrior monks, protecting Christians making the long pilgrimage to the Holy Land. But while some Knights Templar guarded Jerusalem, other Knights were digging beneath it. Day and night they dug, until one day they struck gold, mm. literally. The Brothers of the East were right. They promised the Knights Templar that if they dug under the Temple Mount, they would find artifacts that once belonged to the great civilization of Atlantis. The Knights found a large box made of acacia wood and gold. There was no question they had found the legendary Ark of the Covenant. And then they found five more. So now I'm sitting back wondering, like, how did these dudes... Like, how did they explain this to people? Or they just said, you know what? We just, I guess they just kept it a secret the whole time. Like, the whole time they was there, they never let no Christians know or nothing. I guess they uh, duh, because that's the, what they say, the secret quest. So, more than likely. But it's just like, to me, it would seem like y'all, the, the knights going down there finding something as legendary, as fucking awesome as this you would let people know. But then you think about it, boy, that stuff's still happening right now today. It's happening right now today, my brothers and sisters. The light bulb has went off in my head because that's pretty much what the government doing to us. They know about these aliens and a lot of other crazy-ish, but they not letting us know. Even though you would think that they would let us know. Well, maybe they wouldn't let us know because one of my theories is, is if uh, the government truly let us know about the truth about aliens and stuff. The freaking world might end. Like the the, wor the whole world will go into hysteria if we really knew the truth. Truth. Let's go. Year after year, the Knights Templar pulled treasures from beneath Jerusalem. They found the Spear of Destiny, the Holy Grail, the Emerald Tablet and pages and pages of ancient esoteric wisdom. They learned there were 10 arcs, though they only found six. The arcs were used in conjunction with pyramids around the world to create limitless energy. This was similar to what Nikola Tesla attempted at Wardenclyffe Tower. If you want to learn how this technology worked, we have an episode that explains scientifically how the Great Pyramid of Giza could have been a power generator. Pyramid link below. Mm -hmm. Within the king's chamber of the Great Pyramid is a stone box. Mainstream Egyptology says this box is a sarcophagus to store a mummy, but no mummy was ever found there. And the dimensions of the box are kind of small for a human body, but the box is the perfect size to store one of the arcs. The Knights Templar discovered that the pyramids were built for one specific purpose, to store the arcs. And the arcs, they were built to store mana. Mana? 
In the Bible, manna was a food source that appeared to the Israelites in the desert. It's described as fine flakes that look like frost on the ground. But according to Templar tradition, the Israelites and the Atlanteans before them extracted manna from plant and animal matter and turned it into a monoatomic white powder. This white powder provides energy. A white powder that provides energy? Ah, New York in the 80s was wild, eh? Uh, you're thinking about something else. Ah. <laughs> the mana acted as an electrical superconductor and powered the arcs inside the pyramids. The arcs generated unlimited energy for the thriving civilization. They learned these alchemical secrets from none other than the Emerald Tablet. Emerald Tablet, link below. The Emerald Tablet gave detailed instructions on extracting mana from animal bones. The mana could then be used for energy or even for healing illness. Hey, uh, yeah, didn't the Emerald Tablet also tell you how to become a mortal by making the uh, Philosopher's Stone? Yep. From eating pee? Yes. Eating lots of pee? Yes. Uh, immortality sounds gross. It does, but if you want to be immortal... Hey, no such thing as a free lunch. Nope. Even if lunch is pee. That's enough. Hey, I ain't gonna lie, y'all. As, as AJ always does, he is, is, is outland is just some of this stuff sounding about the mana and how they was able to way back then convert energy and all that. He still be doing a great job of like making you want to believe it. And I'm kind of believing all that. But what I really want to say real quick is about this whole immortality thing. I don't think nobody ever will learn how to make people live forever. You know what I'm saying? Like, I don't give a damn if it's 3,024, 4,024, 10,024. I'm talking about the years. <laughs> I don't care what year it is long as this Earth, planet Earth here. I don't even think freaking aliens who are way more far advanced than us know how to uh, make people, people, that, them, as far as them, that they, they're alien society or whatever. I feel like immortality is the one thing that God, the creator of all the universe restricting any of us from learning period we would never be able to know how to do that because life and death is inevitable for us you know what i'm saying if you're born you're gonna die point blank period i don't give a damn if you're et or you the man down the street from your house <laughs> like for real man Bro, I feel like immortality is not possible ever. Long story short, even though the story was just long. Let's go. Some of these ancient texts even talked about creating mana from gold. When mana was extracted from gold, it could be used to make objects lighter for levitation. Now think about it. The Ark is a box almost four feet long and three feet wide. It's made of gold. Gold is heavy. The Ark of the Covenant also contain the Ten Commandments, which were carved into stone tablets. Stone is heavy. Just the gold would have weighed almost a thousand pounds. That doesn't include the weight of the stone or the acacia wood. Yet it only took four men to carry it. By the way, the men who carried the Ark were Levites. Levite. Levitation. I get a covenant. Link below. The Knights Templar also found very old texts that even predated the civilization of Atlantis. These documents spoke of a non-human race that enslaved humanity thousands of years ago to mine gold. Anunnaki! Mm. Yahtzee. Anunnaki. The Anunnaki come up a lot on this channel, and I promise I'll do a full episode on them, but here's the short version. The Anunnaki were gods worshiped by the ancient Sumerians but they were actually aliens from a planet beyond Neptune called Nibiru. The Anunnaki arrived on Earth about 450,000 years ago, searching for resources, specifically gold. They were trying to solve an atmospheric crisis on their planet. Now, finding gold in abundance, they settled on Earth and established mining operations. Eventually, the Anunnaki created a labor force by genetically modifying early human ancestors, accelerating the evolution of Homo sapiens. We need this episode, Chief. I know, we'll do it, I promise. Yeah, 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 your promises and 60 butts are worth about uh, one night's worth of mana. Okay. So, the Templars knew about the Anunnaki and how they converted gold into a powder used for healing, levitation, and generating electricity. And it wasn't just the Atlanteans and Israelites that knew about mana. Sumerian texts 
spoke of an alchemical science called Graal, which you can't help but notice is similar to the word Grail. The Sumerians used a substance called Shimana that was used to help the Anunnaki gods power their flying craft. In Vedic, Hindu, and Jain texts, this substance was called Vimana, which again was used to power flying crafts. Polynesian cultures believe mana is a force of nature anyone can extract. Buddhists call it mani. Though the words vary slightly in all these cultures, the definition and use are the same. Mana is a potent substance that allows humanity to tap into something very powerful in nature. And by the way, the Templar Cross, you can find that carved everywhere and every time civilization existed. The cross is all over ancient Egypt. And you can even see the cross carved on the ancient Sumerian depictions of the Anunnaki. Templar legend says this was actually the symbol of Atlantis. After Atlantis was destroyed in the Great Flood... Of the Younger Dryas. Yep, the Templar legend of Atlantis and the Great Flood is exactly like every other flood myth we find in every culture around the world. After the Flood, a few survivors restarted civilization with knowledge from Atlantis. The cross was carved in their honor. But not everything the knights found was Atlantean. Some artifacts were from just a thousand years before, during the time of Jesus. Mm. There were ancient texts that confirmed a lot of what was said in the Bible. But some texts contradicted the Bible. There was no way the Knights could let the Church find out what they discovered. The Catholic Church was growing more powerful every year. If the truth came out, it could shake the very foundation of the faith. And, the and see, that's what I was just saying earlier, y'all. And I know some of y'all already understood what I was saying, but the White Files just gave a great example. Like, if... if, if, if the freaking earth i'm talking about everybody man the whole earth finally find out that aliens are real like get real i'm talking about real 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 evidence that aliens do exist man dude the earth man it'll be like that santa claus commercial with the m&ms and the and, and uh, uh santa claus like i do exist and he fell out that'll be the earth falling out when they find out that aliens exist man and it's the same thing with this they trying to keep it quiet because they don't want the christians to lose their faith and go all crazy this is the this is this is an even better way to explain it my brothers and sisters hear me out it's very simple though what if something was to come out? I don't know. I can't come up with nothing. I'm not going to try to come up with nothing. But I'm just saying, what if something was to happen or some kind of evidence was to come out that Jesus Christ did not exist or that he did not die on the cross? That shit was mad. Listen. And if you Christian out here, y'all, my brothers and sisters, if you Christian, I'm not trying to disrespect your religion or nothing like that. None of that right there. But I'm just saying what if to all my brothers and sisters out there, Christian or non-Christian, man, that shit will elf the world up as far as like Christians, man. I don't know what will happen, but that day, once that come out, the world will be changed for freaking ever. And y'all know I ain't lying. Let's get back to the store. The Knights Templar would be destroyed. Besides, much of the Knights funding came from the church. But no historical document compared to the shock of what they discovered next, an ossuary, which is a collection of bones. This ossuary held the bones of a very famous religious family, all buried together. The Knights found the bones of Mary Magdalene, John the Baptist, and Jesus himself. But they also found the bones of the children Mary had with both of them. Wait, hold on. Ho, 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 ho. What? This shit getting crazy for real now. Plot twist. First of all, just saying that he found the fucking, they found the bones of Jesus, Mary, and Joseph. That's already crazy. But this man said the children that he, she, Mary had with both of them. With the both of them, yeah, this shit. That was a that was a Mr. Balling moment right there. That was one of them did not see that coming at all moments. Now let's see what the hell is AJ talking about. My damn eyes and got big. Now let's go. To 
call what the Knights Templar discovered blasphemous would be a huge understatement. They discovered documents and artifacts that would literally destroy the church. They needed to keep these treasures safe from being destroyed. They needed to keep them from falling into the wrong hands, specifically the Pope's hands. The mm. Templars knew that the existence of the bones of John, Jesus, and Mary Magdalene and their children would mean the end of the Catholic Church. But to rub salt in an already gaping wound, the Templars found something potentially even more threatening to the church, an alternate belief system. The Templars were Christian, but not in the strictest sense, as most of Europe was, and more importantly, as their king and employers were. Spreading information contrary to the teachings of the Catholic Church was not only heresy, it was a death sentence. Remember, this was all happening at the time of the Crusades. Religions were at war. The Templars couldn't speak about their findings, but couldn't ignore them either. So instead, they hid them, they protected them, and studied them. Some ancient wisdom included blasphemous ideas like the Divine Feminine, reincarnation, heaven as a state of mind, and an innate connection to the Creator. The Knights maintained their appearance as devout Catholics. They had to. Their biggest patron was the Catholic Church. You don't bite the hand that feeds you, especially the most powerful hand on Earth. But in secret, the Knights Templar were Christian Gnostics. Gnosticism comes from the Greek word gnosis, meaning divine knowledge. Other cultures call this enlightenment. The basic premise is that spirituality can be found within, without needing an outside institution. So no reason to have priests, monks, saviors, or churches at all. You didn't need them to find God. He's already within you. One of the earliest Templar documents mentions God-given rights. Now Americans use this phrase, or something close to it, in the Declaration of Independence. But that was in the 18th century. The idea of God-given rights during the time of the Templars meant excommunication or worse. Only the Roman Church could give someone rights. Any alternative was bad for business. And instead of worshiping Jesus, many Knights Templar idolized John the Baptist, who they believe initiated Jesus into Gnosticism in the Great Pyramid. To the Templars, Jesus represented a Christos, a universal consciousness anyone could access, similar to the Buddha. They learned that being born again didn't refer to baptism. It referred to reincarnation, which someone would literally be born again. With the bones of Jesus, sacred documents, and artifacts from an ancient civilization, the Templars had plenty of evidence to back up their beliefs. Yeah. They wanted to share this knowledge, but it wasn't the right time. The church was too powerful. They would have to wait. They would wait until this knowledge could be shared with the entire world and not seized by one pope or one king. So after years of digging, these early knights returned to Europe with the treasures and knowledge and hid it. And then they built an empire. Mm. For 200 years, the Knights Templar grew and thrived. Their numbers increased from a handful of soldiers to tens of thousands of men and women. Dang. The Catholic Church and Christian lords throughout Europe gave the Knights Templar money, land, and power to help their cause. The Templars created cathedrals, power structures, and systems of democracy. They created the first banking system, a system we still use today. During the Dark Ages, the journey from Europe to Jerusalem was dangerous. Road agents were robbing the pilgrims of everything they had. So the Knights Templars set up locations along the way called commanderies. At any one of these locations, you could deposit your gold in exchange for a note. You then take this note to another commandery and exchange it for gold. And for every transaction, the Knights Templar charged a small fee. It wow. was an ingenious system used by thousands of people for hundreds of years. Over time, those little fees... Boy, history just repeats itself for fucking ever, don't it? That's basically them charging taxes. You know what I'm saying? They taxing the people, man. What the fuck, y'all? This the same thing that is going on in 2024, my brothers and sisters. Just in another way, but it's the same thing. That's just so mind-blowing to hear. Fees added up. Now, individually, the knights were poor. When joining, you gave all your wealth to the order. The order then took care of you and all its members. 
The treasures and knowledge passed from generation to generation, with each Grand Master responsible for their safekeeping. And for those few hundred years, the Knights Templar were extremely successful at distracting the church from their true purpose. A little too successful. Eventually, the Knights Templar had their own armies, their own fleets of ships. They had their own merchants, masons, and farmers. They were independent and self-sustaining. The Knights Templar became the first multinational corporation. They had no need for a king or country. In fact, the opposite happened. The Knights Templar were so wealthy that King Philip of France was borrowing money from them. In the fall of 1307, King Philip IV needed financing for another war. He wasn't going to borrow any more money from the Knights. Instead, he would take it from them. Mm. The Templars had gone from humble defenders of Christianity to a serious threat to the entire power structure of Europe, the King and the Church. And like many powerful rulers, King Philip didn't tolerate threats. So Philip and Pope Clement V devised a plan. Pope Clement, by the way, was born Raymond Bertrand and was a childhood friend of the King. When the previous Pope died in 1304, King Philip made sure his friend was elected to what was one of the most powerful seats of power on Earth. In short, the Pope owed him one. On Friday the 13th of October 1307, 100 Templars, including the Grand Master Jacques de Molay, were arrested. For seven years they were threatened and tortured to try to gain access to their knowledge and wealth. After making false confessions, they were found guilty of heresy and sentenced to death. But now, there's a plot twist. For centuries, history claimed the Church had condemned the Knights Templar as heretics and eventually had them executed. But in 2001, a document was found in the Vatican secret archives. It's called the Chinon Parchment. The Chinon Parchment documented the inquiry led by three cardinals appointed by Pope Clement V. It details the investigation and the charges against the Templar leaders, including the Grand Master Jacques de Molay. The Chinon Parchment reveals that the Pope absolved the Templar leaders of heresy. They were allowed to reconcile with the Church. The Pope would allow the Order of the Knights Templar to continue their work. King Philip didn't like this result. He applied pressure to the Pope. Remember, the Pope owed him one. So in 1312, Pope Clement officially disbanded the Knights Templar. The leaders of the Order, including Jacques de Molay, were later burned at the stake on charges of heresy even though they were forgiven of these crimes. Crazy. But Grandmaster Jacques de Molay would enact a small token of revenge for this betrayal of justice. As he slowly burned to death, Molay issued a curse to the Pope and the King of France. He promised them that they would be dead within a year. This was March of 1314. A few weeks later, Pope Clement was dead. According to one account, while lying in state, he was struck by lightning. The fire was so intense that his body was unrecognizable. And if you read up on this pope, you'll agree that this was divine justice. In November, King Philip had a stroke and died. He was 46 years old. The Templar curse was fulfilled. That's crazy, man. That's crazy that he predicted they dealt and it actually happened. But one thing about this that's kind of like crazy to me also, y'all, is these are supposed to be Christians, but they killing people. You know what I'm saying, man? They killing these Templar Knights, man. And y'all supposed to be like, like, don't Christians like not supposed to murder people? Like, that's just one thing that's sticking out to me that they freaking burning these people at the stake. Literally. That's crazy. France had now lost its king and its pope, and Europe had lost their beloved knights, or so it seemed. Mm. When the arrest order was given on October 13th, the Knights Templar knew it was coming. They had spies everywhere they had known for weeks, and they used those weeks to plan. On October 12th, the night before the arrest order was given, the Templar's entire fleet of ships disappeared into the darkness. And aboard those ships, were all the ancient Atlantean artifacts, the holy treasures, and forbidden documents. Jacques de Molay and about a hundred knights stayed behind. They hoped they could reason with the king and the pope. They failed in that mission, but succeeded in another. Disbanded, but not destroyed. In hiding, but not in prison. The Templars formed into smaller groups. 
They assimilated into other orders. Some assumed new identities and disappeared altogether. The Knights Templar in name ended in 1312, but their mission continued. In fact, it continues today. The evidence is everywhere. Hmm. Evidence of the Knights Templar can be found all over the world. After they disbanded, they were determined to keep their knowledge and traditions alive, so they created alias groups to avoid detection. In Scotland, they became Freemasons. Portugal, they were known as the Knights of Christ. In Germany, they created Rosicrucianism. There's also evidence of them in the early Americas. Nova Scotia has the legendary Oak Island, with buried Templar treasure and deadly curses. An indigenous tribe in Panama, known as the White Indians of Darien, have pale skin and Caucasian features. Some believe they're descendants of the first Templars in the Americas. When asked about the Knights Templar, the natives called them our brothers. In early Europe, Templars were the first Vikings. The first pirates were Knights Templar. The famous skull and crossbone symbol, the Jolly Roger, that flag was first flown by the Templar Navy to frighten their enemies before battle. One of the most famous Templar symbols is the Red Cross with a white background. Another is the depiction of several knights on a horse, like this statue in London. Both of these are found in cathedrals and chapels all across Europe. If you read... You know what it sounds like AJ telling me right now? All of us got a little Knights Templar up in us. Just a little bit, you know what I'm saying? I feel like a lot of us out here got a little bit of the Knights Templar up in us, y'all. And that was a long time ago, so it is possible. Anything's possible. Read or saw the Da Vinci Code, you may remember Roslyn Chapel in Scotland. Pagan and Templar symbols are on every inch of it. Some, like this carving of a knight on horseback, are obvious. This is the gravestone for William Sinclair. It's in the lower part of Roslyn Chapel. It specifically says, Knight Templar. William Sinclair had no love for the church and provided help to any Knights Templar who asked for it. But it's not just crosses and horses that the Knights engraved on their architecture. There are more subtle clues relating to some of their Gnostic and sometimes pagan beliefs. Sculptures of angels in strange positions are common in Roslyn Chapel and are an important rite in Freemasonry. But Freemasonry wasn't supposed to have started until 1717. Roslyn Chapel was built in 1446. Over 100 of these little green men are scattered around Roslyn Chapel. They're pagan symbols and thought to originate from ancient Celtics. Paganism simply refers to anything that isn't Christian, Muslim, or Jewish. Why would there be hundreds of non-Christian symbols in a Catholic church? Templar legend says they were placed there as a message. Some of the more interesting carvings are of plants that Europeans never should have known about. This is a picture of corn over one of the windows in Roslyn Chapel, and here's one of Trillium. But corn and Trillium are native to North America. Roslyn Chapel was built almost 50 years before Columbus sailed to the New World. How would Templars know what these plants look like? Well, isn't it obvious? They were there first. What the? Get the fuck out of here, man. AJ, he, he need to chill out on this video. This dude saying some crazy outlandish stuff that'll just have me looking at everything that I thought about history completely different. So now the Indians weren't the first ones to be here in the United States, in North America, my brothers and sisters. Man, it's some mind-blowing-ish going on right now. Templar legend says Sir Henry Sinclair, grandfather of the builder of Roslyn Chapel, was not only a Templar, but was among the first Europeans to visit the New World. Not only that, but Christopher Columbus himself was associated with the Knights. He was a distant relative of the Sinclairs. Columbus's daughter was married to the Grand Master of the Order. He had access, as all Grand Masters do, to ancient knowledge of the Knights Templar, including their maps. Columbus knew there was something on the other side of the Atlantic. He didn't know what, but he knew there was land and treasure. He knew this because the Knights Templar had maps of the New World for centuries. One of these was the Piri Reis map, and you know this famous map. It shows the New World and Antarctica hundreds of years before they were rediscovered. Piri Reis, by the way, was a cartographer from Istanbul. 
which in his time was Constantinople, birthplace of the Knights Templar. Was Puriris a Templar? Maybe. Coincidence? Maybe. But when Columbus wanted to sail to the New World, he first approached King John of Portugal for financing. King John refused, so Columbus went to Portugal's enemies, Spain and England. Queen Isabella of Spain came up with the money first, and the rest is history. But Templar history tells a different story. They say Portugal refused to finance Columbus because they already knew about the New World. Knights Templar had been sailing there for years. Portugal was populated by so many knights that it was considered a Templar nation. In fact, the word Portugal means Port of the Gauls, but Templars say it really means Port of the Grail. Oh. Knights Templar history says they were trading with Native American tribes for years. That's where they got a lot of their gold. And the Templars had a very good relationship with the people of the New World. Columbus knew this. How do we know? Well, when Columbus sailed the ocean blue in 1492, the Nina, the Pinta, and the Santa Maria all flew flags with the Templar cross. Yeah. He knew the natives would recognize this symbol and be peaceful. And they were at first. Sadly, the Europeans didn't return the favor. The Knights Templars say they were the first Europeans to visit the Americas. Fine. But can they prove it? They can. Okay, time out. Maybe I uh, misunderstood AJ because I was thinking he was saying even before Indians, even before the native Native Americans was on uh, this U.S. soil, this North American soil, there was uh, the Templars already had been here before. But he's saying, I think I'm getting it right now, y'all. He is saying that um the freaking uh what their names is the Templars had been visiting. North America way before Christmas uh for Columbus visited. And that's just still mind blowing if that's a fact. You know what I'm saying, man? Because what have the books taught us? What have history taught us? Christopher Columbus was the one to discover America. So it's still crazy. But that may have been my misunderstanding, y'all. But let's go. In 1898, Olaf Oman was clearing land on his farm in Minnesota when he stumbled upon a strange looking rock. It was a tablet, about 30 inches tall and 16 inches wide. Carved in it were symbols that Oman didn't recognize. This tablet became known as the Kensington Runestone. Oman had it analyzed and translated. The inscription said it was left by Viking travelers in 1362. And this isn't a stone found on the coast. These Vikings were in the middle of the continent. Vikings in the New World, a century before Columbus. Now remember, according to Templar tradition, the first Vikings were Knights Templar. Then there's the Narragansett runestone, found in Rhode Island in 1939, also with Viking runes. Only 14 miles from where this runestone was discovered is Newport Tower. This is a mysterious eight column structure. It's rumored to have been built by Vikings in the 1500s to track the solstices. The local museum says it's just the base of a lighthouse, but most locals disagree. As far back as the early 1800s, records and legends have given credit to Vikings. But why eight columns? Why not just build it as one solid cylinder? Well, the answer leads us back to Gnosticism. The number eight is highly significant to Gnostics. It represents completeness, a divine fullness, Remember earlier when I mentioned Jesus was initiated in the Great Pyramid? Well, there's a reason for that. If you watch the episode that we had about the pyramids, link below. You'll remember that the Great Pyramid has eight sides, not four. To this day, Templars are initiated in the Great Pyramid, and they believe that Egypt was one of the main sources of wisdom for the original knights. And if you look, the number eight is everywhere in Templar symbolism and architecture. The Maltese cross has eight points, and was worn by a medieval order of knights that were attacked by fire. Today, it's the symbol of many firefighters. A shout out to NYFD, New York's bravest, eh? Hear, hear. Buildings like Temple Church and Ely Cathedral in England have octagonal features and the number eight scattered all over the place. You only have to look at a few pictures of Roslyn Chapel to start seeing the number showing up again and again. Evidence of the Knights Templar is everywhere. Now, we can't cover the Knights without mentioning the Freemasons. Countless rites, symbols, and beliefs connect the two groups almost seamlessly. Masons trace their origins back to the Temple of Solomon, just like the Templars. 
On Oak Island, Nova Scotia, a money pit was discovered in 1795, along with a Templar engraving. Since then, the Freemasons have been involved in almost every search for the lost treasure. Both Masonic symbols and Templar crosses are scattered across the island. The connection between the groups is so deep that they still see each other as brothers to this day. Mm. Another Templar connection is with Rosicrucianism, which heavily emphasizes the rose and the cross, both Templar symbols. But why? Why did the Templars spend so much time and money hiding their legacy? Well, the Knights Templar had a higher purpose. Their ultimate goal was to change the world for the better. They knew the ancient artifacts and knowledge would be a shock to society. But this knowledge was never meant to stay hidden. Eventually, the Knights will share the truth. And the truth might come out sooner than you think. Man, the damn truth need to come out right now. You know what I'm saying, man? Like, I get it, though. And it's the same thing we going through with the government and stuff. They they just feel like if they was to let this information out, the damn world would go crazy. And I really do believe that. But let's see what uh, AJ talking about, man, as far as the truth coming out sooner than we would than we think. Timothy Hogan is the current Grand Master of one of the Templar Orders. He's on a mission to prepare the world to embrace their secrets. He insists that this knowledge is powerful enough to drastically alter our society as we know it in a positive way. Currently, all the Templar treasures are hidden in vaults around the world, seven of which are here in the United States. And according to Hogan, the world is just about ready for their release. He says they'll do it in a way where no one government, no one religion, will have complete access to the information. The release of information will be controlled to ensure everyone benefits. Because really, that's the Templars' entire purpose. It has been since the beginning. They wanted freedom for the people. Physical freedom from the king, and spiritual freedom from the pope. Unfortunately, it wasn't possible in the 14th century. But today, it could very well succeed. We're at a pivotal point in history where many feel like something is about to happen. They just don't know what, and I feel it too. Now that might be nothing more than humanity's obsession with death and the end of the world, yeah. but maybe it's more than that. I think we all know that we can't go on living this way. Constant wars around the world, the hatred within our countries, the dishonesty of our leaders, the corruption of our institutions, it has to stop. Imagine how different our lives would be if we had access to ancient wisdom and technology. It would be a revolution. We could finally wow. do what Nikola Tesla almost did, create free energy for the entire planet. It would take a while, but eventually, everyone on Earth could access healthy food, clean water, and live long, healthy lives free of illness and pain. It would be a revolution. Crime. It would be a fucking perfect world. That's what this is, a perfect world. And poverty and war wouldn't be necessary in a world of abundance, all due to the artifacts being held in secret vaults around the world. It would be a revolution. That is, if they're real. Hmm. Now here comes the part where uh, AJ started to debunk everything he just said, man. Got me believing some of this shit, and now he's going to debunk all of it. Today's story of the Knights Templar comes from one man, Timothy Hogan. He's the Grand Master of the Order of the Temple of Secret Initiates, the OTSI. He tells the story of ancient wisdom, alchemy, holy relics, and Atlantean artifacts. It's a fascinating story. But is it true? Well, there's nothing to debunk about his story, but there's also no physical evidence to prove it. So it really comes down to Mr. Hogan. Do you believe him? Now, you know what? I'm going to call him Tim because I know he's watching. Hi, Tim. This is the part of the episode where I tell you all the positive and negative things I can about the author of the story. But today, we have to do things a little differently. Recently on live streams, I've been cold reading rough drafts of scripts for this channel. You probably assume this, but I have a team of writers, researchers, and contributors because, well, I, I need to. My cute 12-minute videos about weird animals have now become 40-minute documentaries. I'm just a guy who talks to a fish. I need help. Anyway, when I read the scripts live, I'm literally reading them for the first time along with you. Obviously, they're never final scripts. I rewrite everything I'm given. I also research and fact check as much as I can. <laughs> oh yeah, then this one has to put in his jokes. Nah, you'd be nothing without me. Oh. Nothing! 
<laughs> but here's where things took a turn. First, after reading the draft, I was contacted by a viewer. Hi, Stan. Stan knows Timothy Hogan. He felt that the script was unfair to him, that it attacked him too personally. And you know what? I think Stan was right. You can still see the live read on the channel under the live tab, but here's the short version. The script brought up Tim's divorce and a situation he had with a woman who was suffering from addiction and mental illness. She took over his Facebook page and posted wild stuff as him, like she was the reincarnation of Mary Magdalene, so that makes him Jesus and things like that. And look, those things happened, and it's not a good look. But are they relevant to his story about the Knights Templar? Absolutely not. Just like my exes aren't relevant to the work I do now. Hey, you got some real pieces of work in your past. I know. Some real pieces of work, I tell you. I know. I went through some rough patches. Your wife is a saint. I can't deny that. But that's the point. Tim's personal life is just that. Personal, and I don't really like gossip. <laughs> Okay, I like gossip, but I don't do it on the channel. No, you do it on the live streams. Okay, that's fine. Let me get through this. So Tim's personal life is irrelevant, but his professional life regarding his work with and as a Knights Templar is relevant. Tim has detractors, people that don't like him, people that don't believe him. I asked the researcher where she found these people. They're on Reddit, aren't they? They're on Reddit. <laughs> oh, they hate you on Reddit too. Oh, they don't love you either. Fair enough. Reddit is a crazy place in the in, uh, in, uh, in internet community, y'all. Like, Reddit, man, I am not going to even get on Reddit, man. Not, like, physically. I was, what I'm, I'm, I'm saying I'm not going to even start to talk about that. Because you can, man, listen, y'all. If you don't know what Reddit is, then I advise you never to find out. <laughs> I'm exaggerating a little bit. But Reddit is wild, y'all. But I really want to just uh, say much respect to AJ, y'all, for doing what he just did, man. You know, well, not what he did right there. He just told us what he just did what i'm saying is just shout out to him to taking all the personal stuff out of this video as he was telling this story man salute to him for that because there are so many people out here who will take what somebody had going on in their past and try to apply it to who they are now or try to make it seem like it got something to do with something else and it has nothing to do with that but they still want to bring it up because it make them look it brings make them into a negative light you know what I'm saying? It, it make them look bad, and that's why they want to bring it up. When you really bringing it up, and bro, this ain't got nothing to do with what you telling me about. You know what I'm saying? And just shout out to uh, AJ for doing that, man. And Reddit, y'all, is a crazy place. Let's go. Tim's detractors are what seem to be members of different orders of the Knights Templar or other fraternal organizations. It's actually hard to follow if you're not in that world. Now, people often ask me if I'm a Mason or in groups like that, and I'm not. And I joke that I'm not a joiner. I don't play well with others, because that's true. So when people talk about Grand Masters and Seventh Degrees and secret handshake grips and all that stuff, I don't get it. I don't impugn it, but I really don't get it. But the people that are in those groups do get it, and they take it very seriously. There's been infighting with these various orders for a thousand years, and it's still happening. This board voted Tim off, or that group wanted him out. He didn't like what another group was doing, so he left, that kind of thing. Are the internal politics of these fraternal groups relevant to his story of the Knights Templar? To me, no. There are people who call Tim a fraud, that he makes claims that aren't true. Well, I'm gonna read you a few of his claims, and these are Tim's words in an email to me. Laugh it up gonna happen to you too. It was also suggested that I say I'm a descendant of a Revolutionary War Templar, which is actually true. My great-grandfather seven generations back was General Joseph Warren of the Revolutionary War. True. He initiated Paul Revere and he helped plan the Boston Tea Party. He was an alchemist and a doctor, a Templar Grand Commander for the region, and his relationship with Paul Revere was largely based on studying alchemy. Paul Revere was a silversmith. That's true. My grandfather, Hugh Warren, also taught metallurgy at Denver University. My great-grandfather, James Baden Warren, also knew metallurgy, and he was the Grand Lecturer for the Masonic Grand Lodge of Pennsylvania, and he was a Grand Commander of the Knights Templar. True. My father was Stephen D. Hogan, Mayor of Aurora, Colorado, and had been active in politics my entire life. He was also a Templar. 
There are highways and convention centers named after him in Colorado. True. We continue covering Colorado First at Five, and we travel to Aurora, where the city hosted a groundbreaking event for the Stephen Hogan Parkway. The project closed about a two-mile gap between the existing six Parkway on the west and E-470 on the east. But even though he always had politics going on, uh, he always tried to make time for us individually and to, to make us feel special. I ran for mayor after he passed away in a special election and lost by two votes. Anyhow, my family on both sides had been Templars, and I was first knighted into the tradition at eight years old as a page. Now, I've seen these claims challenged online, but everything I could find says that Tim is telling the truth about his family. There are a few other criticisms of him online that he addressed in his emails to me. I don't find a lot of it relevant. It's mostly personal, but Google him and decide for yourself. Here's where I stand. I've watched and listened to interviews with Tim that go back about 10 years. I've read two of his books, well, skimmed. I watched his entire series on Gaia, which is fascinating, by the way. Tim Hogan has an encyclopedic knowledge of the history of the Knights Templar. Names, dates, meanings of words, ancient rituals, everything connecting the Knights to ancient Egypt, various pharaohs and kings and popes, Tim knows it all. And if you're into this subject, listen to one of his interviews. He's knowledgeable and riveting. And when we finally get the studio finished here, Tim agreed to come in and talk to me and have his claims challenged. But what about his claims? Well, from what I gather, and this is only my opinion, Tim will lean into information depending on the situation. Meaning if he's being interviewed by an historian or someone focused on hard facts, Tim sticks to the facts. He'll bring up the theories and label them as such. Legend says, or people say, that sort of thing. If he's in a forum where the wild claims are expected, he'll lean into those. Mm. Now look, I love Gaia. I'm a paid subscriber. But everybody on that channel believes everything. And a lot of it is bunk. A lot of it. But Gaia viewers want the wild stuff. What was Atlantis? Was it a place? A culture? And what happened to it? I'm Timothy Hogan, Grandmaster of the Knights Templar. And I'm Scott Wolter, a forensic geologist and a Knights Templar. And this is Mysteries of the Knights Templar. I don't think Tim believes every theory he discusses. I think he's intelligent and entertaining. And I think he caters to the audience. Now, at first, that might sound dishonest, but it's exactly what I do here. I tell the story, the legend, the myth as it's meant to be told. Then we break it down together. I'm not trying to lie to you. I'm trying to entertain you. I'm not a journalist, I talk to a fish. We do this for fun. True. Now, there are some bold claims that Tim- And that's one thing I wanna say about AJ real quick, y'all. It's people out here on YouTube that be like, really like dissing this man and giving him flack and stuff and like talking bad about him, hating on him because they be saying that he got damn be telling lies and he trying to convince you that all this stuff is truth. No, he not trying to tell us that this whole story is truth. He just being entertaining and giving us a story or something that could possibly be true. You know what I'm saying? But I see so many people like you look it up. You, you'll see videos of people debunking what AJ said. Man, he just giving you a a story man let me calm down i'm starting to get mad now let's finish this video up y'all sticks by like the vaults containing the arcs and ossuaries of remains he says these are real he's seen them and the information is coming out the purpose of the show on gaia is to in tim's words bring people up to speed okay that's fair but that's not evidence and bold claims need hard evidence i'm gonna be very honest one of my most loyal patrons was upset about the Mary Magdalene Jesus John part of the story. That's the ossuary, the bones. He felt it was insulting to Christianity and I should leave it out. But it's such an explosive claim, I needed to tell you about it. If I left it out, I'd feel like a liar and a coward. That said, I did check with other people of faith in my community. They said, it's part of the story, leave it in. And if you followed this channel for a while, you know that I greatly respect religion and people of faith. Well, so uh, I mentioned the arcs. Uh, accordingly, we also have uh, ossuaries with the bones of certain holy figures that we're hanging on to. By the way, I've only seen Tim discuss that story about the bones once, and he was reluctant to do so. He knows it's touchy. 
Well, okay. Well, uh, you just can't get away with <laughs> without naming names. Ossuaries of whom? Uh, well, uh, what we, they would be referred to as the Holy Families. So it would be, uh, you know, John the Baptist, Jesus, Mary Magdalene, and their kids. He said he'll allow DNA testing, but he was also very clear that he had no intention of insulting anyone's faith. One of the biggest hurdles that we're trying to get over with all of this is that uh, we're not trying to invalidate anybody's beliefs. Uh, we're just trying to say that there might be a little bit more to the story. Mm. And I believe him on that point. Tim's been accused of doing... I feel it. I feel that right though. I really understand what he's saying, man. We not trying to make you not believe or say that you believe in the wrong thing. We just trying to say that everything that's in the Bible as far as Jesus and stuff is not the whole story. It's more to it. I can respect that. Now, is he telling the truth or not? I leave that to, for y'all to decide, my brothers and sisters. But I can feel where he's coming from with that doing so many interviews and giving so many lectures because he wants to sell books and get people to watch his show. Does that mean he's lying? No, he's promoting. Graham Hancock is everywhere when he has a book out. He wants people to buy it and read it. So what? I'm a huge fan. I buy all of Graham's books and watch all of his shows and interviews. I've seen every minute of him on Rogan. I don't have to believe everything Graham says, but I enjoy the material. Same with Tim Hogan. You don't have to believe his story to enjoy it. Stories of Atlantean treasure, free energy, and ancient documents, that's nothing new. Those legends have been around forever. Now they may be true. But until we have physical evidence, they are still legends. So is Tim just jumping on the Atlantis bandwagon? Or is the link between the Knights Templar and Atlantis real? Are there really underground vaults hidden around the world with ancient technology that could rid us of poverty and war? The arcs, the artifacts, the emerald tablet, the mana, the bones. Are they real? Well, I need to see them. But if you choose to believe the story without physical proof, that's okay too. I'm not trying to persuade you one way or another. Tim insists that the Templars will reveal these artifacts very soon. If there are no artifacts, why make that promise? When he talks about the divine in each of us, he seems to believe it. But that could be my own bias. Because I also believe that the divine, God, the universal energy, the whatever you call it, I believe that is in each of us. And I don't think that belief has to contradict anyone's faith. That's why it's called faith. If Tim Hogan is telling the truth, humanity's future might not be as doomed as we think. And maybe the catalyst, the change, the evidence we need is hiding in a vault right now, right beneath our feet. I don't know if it is, but I truly hope so. Hmm. Thank you so much for hanging out. This was a great episode from the Wi Fi, man. And I'm just strictly talking about from just a, a, a format or a sequence or just the way he put it all together. Magnificent job, man. Magnificent job. And what he said at the end is one of the main things I wanted to talk to y'all about right now. And I had been thinking about it way earlier in the uh, video. And that is the fact that. God is in all of us, my brothers and sisters. Like, I know I'm not crazy, man. Like, I feel like I really, God is a part of me and I'm a part of God. The creator, whatever word you want to use for him. The one who created, not even just earth, or the, whatever that's on earth. I'm talking about the universe, everything. The creator, the period creator. I feel like he is a part of me i'm a part of him and i'm saying he but it could be a she it could be a it it's everything literally it's everything but and the the reason i'm after watching this video watching this video and just as we was going through it and stuff i started to think like man i understand now why i feel like that and i never thought about this part because god is if god is the the creator of all existence then best believe that he can freaking um be a part of you i it, it's just blowing and some of y'all probably already have came to this thought before my brothers and sisters but i never thought about it in this light you know what i'm saying man that 
God is everything. So yes, he is you. Or a part of you or whatever. Like I and and this another thing, man. Let's go a little deeper, my brothers and sisters. I thought about this too, and it will blow my mind. Like, you know how people be like, and I'm just like it. We have our personal conversation with God. And that was another thing that I love AJ said. That's I'm I'm finna let y'all go. I'm finna let y'all go. Let me just get this off real quick because I know we've been here a long time. But you know how AJ was saying, man, that um uh you ain't gotta have a uh be part of religion or go to church or all that to actually have a relationship with god and that is so true man because all of us feel like we have our personal relationship with god like i'm not i'm not religious at all you know what i'm saying i don't believe in and oh man i'm still going on and on but i'm trying to get my points across y'all that lead me to another thing that i always say man if i offended you at any point in this uh video man hey i'm sorry y'all i'm not trying to disrespect no religions out there but let's get back to the let's get back on the main road i am not religious my brothers and sisters and i have said it feel like a thousand million kabillion times on this channel now but at the same time, I still feel like there is a creator and I feel like I have a special connection with him that no one else has. And it has been a billion quadrillion people to live. I'm not even just talking about now the what seven plus billion people that's on earth. I'm talking about in all time. I don't even know what that number could be, but it's crazy. I'm saying that I feel like all of us have our own personal connection with God. And God, he is the only one to cut that. That shit really is, is like that because he is freaking God and he got it back with you. Like, just the thought of that. I never thought about it from God perspective. Like, yes. That is freaking God. Yes, he really do have a personal connection with you. It is possible because anything is literally possible when it comes to God. And I digress. <laughs> Let the church say amen, man. Let the church say amen, my brothers and sisters. I'm going to go let y'all go now. This was a great video by the, uh, the Wi-Fi, man. And I like how he was keeping it real about his whole... um way making this video and actually talking to the man and you know just keeping it 100 he kept it 100 man salute to all our boy aj love his videos i learned a lot today glad that y'all came on back i'm gonna let y'all go now but before y'all leave make sure you hit the like button you comment subscribe and do all that and you know you gotta come back tomorrow because we're going back to the man the lil the legend just the ball. And until then, my friends, I also got to say this. Love, peace, and happiness. Stay safe. Don't stop. Keep going. Yeah.